you know, sometimes, uh, and it can be, it can be in, even in times like, like that, um, when we're, we're thinking about uh, various uh, things that are going on in people's lives, sometimes within our own lives, and things that we have to deal with, there are questions that come. Um, people have, have asked the question, why doesn't God heal me? Um, or why did they have to die? There's those kind of questions that come even, and you, you might you might hear uh, something like, you know, if if God could part the Red Sea and He could part the Jordan River and people could walk across on dry land, dry land, why doesn't He show that power today? Um, that we could see something like that. And there's those kind of questions that come at times. Um, I mean, especially right now, I know there's there's places that are flooding from uh, heavy rains and hurricane and and those type of things, and you think you know why why can't God just control that and it just dries up and it goes away? Well, obviously, we in our belief in God, we know that He could, so maybe that's it. That isn't isn't the right way to ask the question, but it's it's nothing new. Turn to Judges, if you will. I want to look at Gideon and some of the statements. That are, and we're, we're not going to we're not going to just focus on Gideon. We've done that um, in the fairly recent past, uh, looking at Gideon and the various things that that transpire there with him. But uh, Gideon was a man who who had faith in God, and yet um, he was questioning things because of the circumstances, things within the culture and society in his day and time. Um, they were oppressed by the Philistines. They were scared. He was scared. He was, uh, you know, threshing out wheat and uh, doing it in the wine press so he wouldn't be seen, and and uh, because he was afraid of them and various things going on there. So I, we have the circumstance where Gideon has been or is getting ready to be called by God, and it's in chapter six of Judges, and say beginning in verse eleven, this conversation. It says, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash and Abizrite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, by the way, I think I said Philistines a minute ago, um, but so is the Midianites, and it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Then Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? You see the question? You know, if God is with us, why is this taking place? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the land of Midian. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? Now we we see the rest of the conversation and Gideon saying, you know, I'm not the one. You know, I'm the least in my family. My family's the least in the tribe. Our tribe's the least in all the tribes of Israel. I mean, all these issues like, I am definitely not the one to do this. But he calls him valiant warrior and he's go in this your strength. It's interesting that he says, go in this, your strength, in the midst of him saying, you know, where are your miracles at, God? I'm, I'm, I've been expecting something, and there's nothing. Where are your miracles? And so we, we see that even in the day of Gideon, and as these things take place, people, at least Gideon, who God called a valiant warrior, even though he wasn't yet acting like one. But he was asking the same kind of questions. You know, we've heard what you did. You know, our fathers and our forefathers told us about, delivered us out of Egypt. Well, what's going on now? Why, why is this happening? If we turn over to the New Testament, start in Matthew chapter 11. I want to see a question that comes out. Um, from John Baptist, and so we'll look in Matthew 11, and I've got several passages that we'll look at on this. There's there's some statements that are made that I think we need to see about miracles. Um, chapter 11, and I'm going to start in verse 1 of chapter 11. 
Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, it says, When Jesus had finished giving instructions to his twelve disciples, departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John, while imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by the disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? John knew that he was paving the way for the Messiah. And and so he's he's asking Jesus, he sends word, are you the expected one or we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to him, listen to what Jesus says. He sends word back to him. Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. John is asking, are you the one? And Jesus says, go back and tell him the things that you see. And he starts naming off miracles. You go back and tell him the things that I am doing. And we see all these miracles taking place. Well, there's a reason for that because they weren't just miracles. They were signs. They were something that John, if John knew everything that Jesus was doing, he would come to the conclusion. Jesus didn't have to say, you, you go back and tell John, yes, I'm the Messiah. He said, go back and tell John the things that I'm doing. Because John will get it. John will know he is the Messiah. These things are being done. He is the one that is expected. John chapter 3 and verse 2, if you want to flip back over there with me, it says, beginning verse 1, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. They were accomplishing exactly what they were supposed to accomplish. A lot of times we think, okay, the miracles, they were to accomplish somebody that was crippled being able to walk. That's, that, was, that was why he did it, was so that they could walk. That somebody had died, and he raised them from the dead. And that's why he did it, so he could raise them from the dead. So the, the, the point of him doing the miracles was because it was confirming who he was. They weren't just miracles. So we, I want to look at a few more passages that talk about that. In Acts chapter 2, and we looked at, at this, oh, it's been a month or two ago, when we were looking at Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, and the same, same passage that we're looking at today is in chapter 2 and verse 22, that Peter is making the point, after he's quoted from the prophet Joel, and he's preaching, if you will, the first gospel sermon, so to speak, People are responding to Christ because of what he's saying this day. And in verse 22, he says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. So these things were proof to these people. That they they experienced what Jesus was doing. It says he was attested to you. He was proved because he was doing the things that it would be impossible for anybody else to do if he were not who he said he was. In Hebrews chapter 2, look at verses 3 and 4 there. Hebrews chapter 2. I know we're going to several passages, but I just want to nail down this point. I'm going to start in verse 1 so we get the context. Hebrews 2, 1. For this reason we must pay closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them both signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So God was testifying in them. 
by the things that he was allowing them do, even starting with Jesus, but then even through the giving of the Holy Spirit to his apostles and those to whom they would lay their hands upon. And so when we, when we recognize why the miracles were there, it was to prove who they were. It was to prove that Jesus was Jesus, that Jesus was Messiah. God doesn't part the Red Sea for every generation. And for us to expect him to part the sea for every generation is somewhat even a lack of faith. We see a description of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Later on in the same chapter of 11, verse 6, that without faith it is impossible to please him. And so there has to be some reliance on faith. And when we look at the miracles, if, if we're just looking for signs, and that's one of the things that, that the Jews were doing over and over again, and it came up over and over again, not only in Jesus' time, when he says, unless you see a sign, you won't believe. I mean, how many signs do I have to show you? They would continually come to him and say, show us a sign. And when Paul's writing about it, um, you know, he's... He's even saying that's the thing that the Jews are seeking is a sign. That's what they want to see in order to believe. And sometimes we may become that type of person just looking for a sign from God. Faith is a substance of things hope for the evidence of things not seen. And so when we when we recognize God's desire for us to believe in Him and to believe in Him to a point that we will that we will have faith, that we will trust Him in even the things that we will do. If you will turn to John chapter twenty. Verse thirty through 31, it's, it's John in the end of, of what he's writing, or toward the end of it. And it says this in verse 30, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, because these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Jesus has done the signs. They are there. They still stand. Men, even directed by God, to write these things down, to, to put them down for us, even went to their deaths. Not just claiming, but proclaiming that these things were true. Even as Paul said, and not cleverly devised tales, because we're dying for this. And so when we, when we recognize Jesus did these things, he did them for signs, he did them for us, so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, with all that said, I want to look at another situation that is extremely interesting. In no way do I think we can conclude, okay, if the miracles were just for signs, then that and done. Because we have a circumstance, and if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 15. There's, there's more than one account occasion of this that we could look at, and I've just picked this particular one. But in Matthew chapter 15, look, start with me in verse 21. It says, Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered her and said, I was sent only to the lost 
sheep of the house of Israel. Does that sound like the Jesus you know? I see a few. This woman is imping him. My daughter is demon possessed. Please help. And he's ignoring her. He's he's not answering at all until his disciples, you know, say, "Make her go away. She's bothering us. She's she's yelling at us. Make her go away." Now keep in mind the culture that all of these people were living in. I mean, this is not a this is not a Jewish woman, and so as she's talking to them, this would have been bothersome to them. I mean, this is this is in a public setting. This would have been bothersome to them. And Jesus came while he was here for what purpose? The Jew first and also to the Greek, but the Greek coming later on, or the Gentile. And so Jesus was here. He was working with the Jewish people. He was working with those who were lost of the house. House of Israel, and that's what he was doing all of these things for. We've already looked. That's what these miracles were for. I was sent on to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse twenty-five. But she came and began to bow down for him, saying, "Lord, help me." And he answered and said, "It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs." This is reality. This was. This was what was happening. So what was the purpose in the miracles? Why, why were they there? What we've seen is, and Jesus was following true to that, what we've seen is they were, it wasn't because Jesus wanted to make this person well and not this person well, but they were for signs for the house of Israel so that they would believe in Him. And that's the reason John said these things were written down so that people would believe in Him. At this point, to expect a Gentile woman to understand anything about the Messiah, Jesus wasn't interested in that. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Sounds extremely harsh. But she said, yes, Lord. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Her faith was already there. So to recognize the compassion of Jesus... Not that he was doing it because it was something for himself. I mean, we see those temptations that came to Jesus just because he might have wanted to do something that would have been good for himself. In all those situations, those three, when, when it has Satan coming directly to Jesus, when he comes out of the wilderness, I mean, turn these stones into bread, could he have done it? I'm well, sure he could have done it. There's no problem. If you can turn water to wine, you can turn stones to bread. You know, cash off off the pinnacle of the temple. Angels will come down and swoop you up. That's not the way you're supposed to die. You know, bow down to me. You can have all of this. That would have been selfish. That would have all, there, there would have been nothing that would have brought the glory to the Father in those things. But when it came to compassion for another person, even doing this miracle, not because of the sign, but because of compassion, she already had the faith. It wasn't going to be necessary. And he wasn't going to do it for the Jewish people. Actually, probably most of them would have been disappointed that he did it. Even close to what's his first approach. But it helps us to understand the reason for his approach. 
and yet the compassion that will bring a miracle into somebody's life. And that's what we see here in this circumstance. So when we, when we consider Jesus and we consider the things that he's doing, I just want to come up if you can. Within our lives, there are times that we may ask the question, why doesn't God take care of this for me? When we put the miracles in context, why were there? We know that the physical things that were done were to some degree temporary. If a man was raised from the dead, he died again. Lazarus isn't still living with his day. He died again physically. The young girls or the young man that Jesus raised from the dead, they died again. Those were temporary things. They were there for a purpose. And so when we recognize that the healings took place, but it didn't mean that people didn't get sick again, didn't mean they still didn't, they still weren't appointed once to die. Those were temporary. And we look at the temporary so often as the most important if God would just take care of this now. But Jesus had a deeper reason. Because if we have faith in Him, the healing is a spiritual one that lasts forever. If we trust in Him, then it doesn't matter what happens physically. We have an eternity. And we have the opportunity to share that with other people and bring them into eternity. That change is not a life that, that you would see the joy that somebody would leap up and start not just walking, but running around. But it's something that would affect them eternally. And a joy that's not based upon a happiness, but a joy that is based upon Him. We didn't read verse 29 of John chapter 20. We just started in verse 30, so I want to close with this. Jesus said to him, this was to Thomas, He said, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and believed. If you need to respond to this today, in whatever way, whether it's simply in your heart and your faith in Him and between Him and you, or if you need to come and pray or somebody to pray with you, um, that invitation is here. Or if you need to accept Christ because you realize he is who He is. He is who He said He was. And I need Him in my life. Come as we stand in.